There we go. Yeah, you are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, everybody on Zoom, hear me okay? Um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to give this talk. So I was asked to talk to you about the Turing Way project and how it promotes reproducible data science and research. So um, I'm going to give a short presentation um, with an overview of the project and how you can get involved. And then I'm gonna do a quick walkthrough um, demonstration of the book, the project and the pathways for how you can get involved in this open source project. So there should also be plenty of time at the end for any questions. The slides are already available online. Um, the link is in the Slack workspace or you can view the DOI on each of the slides in case you wanna view them on your own machine. So my name is Rachel Ainsworth. I am the research software community manager for the Software Sustainability Institute, which we've heard a few times about um, the past few days. Um, and I'm based at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. I'm also a member of the directorate for the UK SKA Regional Center Project, where I co-lead the work package to promote, uh, sorry, to prototype the FAIR data archive for the UK node. And I also lead a work package around computational and open science training and outreach for the user community. Um, and my background is in radio astrophysical research. Um, just really quickly, I just want to promote um, some jobs that we have available in the UK SK Regional Centre project. There are a few um, research associate positions available at Cambridge, along with a computing operations engineer for radio astronomy. And then we have project and community manager position available at University College London. And then soon we'll have some positions at Manchester opening up um, for data stewards, research software engineers and more. Um, so just keep an eye on the UK SRC website um, for any upcoming vacancies. But on to what I came here to talk about today, which is the Turing Way. So what is the Turing Way? It is an open source project that involves and supports its diverse community in making data science reproducible, ethical, collaborative, and inclusive for everyone. So in addition to being an open source project where open source principles are applied to the development and maintenance of the project, it is also a book it is also a global grassroots community where people come together to collaboratively write chapters, build and maintain resources, and share their skills and ideas around best practices in data science and research. And it is also a collaboration because the process is the backbone of the project. So it's kind of, you know, moonshot goal and aim is to make collaborative, reusable and transparent research too easy not to do. So we've heard a lot over the past, you know, day or two. Um, we've, we've learned about a lot of tools about why open science is important. But what's really great about this project is it's developed by the grassroots community. So if you ever need to, you know, go back and, you know, you want to learn a bit more about, you know, why we want to practice research in this way, or, you know, if you want to brush up on some skills um, that we've been talking about over the past few days, this is a really really, really handy resource for people who are just getting started um, in open science and reproducible research. Uh, the Turing Way is led by the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Um, so they host it, but it's not exclusive to the Alan Turing Institute. Um, it is developed under their research program called Tools, Practices, and Systems. And the core values of this program are to embed and to deliver trustworthy systems, transparent reporting, inclusive interoperable design, ethical integrity, respectful co-creation, and leadership in open research. So the Turing Way sits across most of these goals, um, and it provides a central resource for good practices to all researchers within the UK and also internationally. So I'll start with definitions, even though we've talked a lot about reproducibility already, I just want to make sure we're on the same page for this talk, because even in different domains and in different literature, reproducibility can mean different things. And often we kind of throw around other interchangeable words such as, you know, replication or repeatability. So to be really explicit about what we mean um, for reproducibility for this talk, Reproducible research means that the results can be independently verified from the same data and the same analysis methods, such as code or software, that the original team used. So, for example, a referee can take your same data set and your same analysis, your same scripts, your same codes, your same software, and they can get the same result that you presented in your paper. So that's what we mean by reproducible in this talk. In comparison, uh, 
replicability uh, can mean that the same analysis can be used on different uh, data sets to verify the results. And then, of course, in science and research more broadly, we aim for our results to be more robust and generalizable um, and to be verified through different analysis methods um, and different data sets. Um, and observations. Um, however, reproducibility in computational analysis should be maintained as a minimum standard criteria to ensure the quality and integrity of our research. And it is apparent that reproducibility can be defined quite simply, um, and there are tools avail available to address many requirements. However, as we heard from Lourdes yesterday, it is also crucial to understand that a reproducible workflow involves making complex decisions at every step of the way. So the integration of our personal choices uh, for methods, as well as personal values and biases, starts right when we have a research idea. And we start by communicating our ideas with potential collaborators, plan and design the work, and then we choose and describe um, the protocol and collect the data. As the research goes on, we continue to process and wrangle our data, conduct our studies and analysis, and publish our data along with other research components so that everyone can access it. And of course, we should also archive our data, as we've talked a lot about, to ensure that it is preserved and reusable, meaning that somebody else can go through this whole process of reproducing or building upon our work. And I don't know about you, but this can be quite an overwhelming process. You know, we've heard a lot about different tools, about different methods, about all of these things that we should be doing in order to make our work reproducible and open. But that is a lot of things to keep in your mind. And especially when you're just getting started out, this can be really overwhelming. So um, what this project hopes to do is it hopes to help you every step of the way. So it usually, you know, recommends starting, you know, with one particular aspect, getting that integrated in your research workflow, and then, you know, adopting the next open science practice so that you don't get too overwhelmed that you don't engage with this process at all. Um, but it is not just about data practices. It also includes the way we communicate our work with others, how we design our project, how efficiently we collaborate with each other. And then of course, all of this while ensuring the highest ethical standards in our research. So I should say here that this project is cross-disciplinary. So it's not just astrophysics focused. Um, so there's a lot of input from across various research domains into this project. So with the definition of reproducibility from the previous slides, this project started with contributors who documented best practices, guidance, and recommendations in chapters, describing various concepts and tools that can ensure reproducibility aspects of data science and research. So these initial chapters included topics such as open research, so you know a nice overview of what it is and why it's important. Uh, topics such as version control, we've heard a lot about, you know, Git and GitHub and GitLab and all of these various version control tools, and this provides, you know, a nice guide on why it's important and how to do it. Um, it includes a chapter um, on licensing, so, you know, we've talked a lot about allowing others to reuse our outputs or reuse our data, reuse our software. If you don't even know where to start in terms of how to license your data, this is a really good um, chapter to read on, you know, which licenses are most appropriate for your work. Um, data management. So we heard um, from Muhammad earlier, you know, storing your data separately to your software. This chapter talks a lot about good data management practices. Um, there are chapters on code testing and reviewing, continuous integration, and more. But in order to accommodate all of the requirements in a research, uh, in research and data science, the project expanded to include four more guides. So one on project design, one on communication, one on collaboration, and one on ethical research. And then the project also records all of the community practices that are developed and practiced within the Turing Way in its community handbook so that it can be adopted by other open source communities and projects. So I'm going to give a quick overview of each guide um, and each guide, you know, contributors documented best practices, guidance, case studies and recommendations in chapters and subchapters describing the various concepts and tools. So as I mentioned, the, guy, uh, the project started off as a guide to reproducible research uh, before it expanded. So this is the first and longest guide so far. 
Um, like I mentioned, some of the chapters um, and content in this guide include open research, which covers aspects such as, you know, open access, open data, open source software, open scholarship, and more. So if you want a refresher, if you want to remind yourself about these concepts that we've talked about over the past day or two, um, this is a good place to go. Um, version control. So if you want to get started with Git and GitHub, um, there's a really comprehensive guide and a lot of material on how to use Git and the project um, regularly uh, hosts workshops um, remotely for anybody who wants to get hands on and, and get some experience with Git and GitHub. Uh, the chapter on research data management, which talks a lot about the FAIR principles. So if this is your first time hearing about uh, the FAIR principles, this is a good place to go to read more about them and why they're important. Uh, reproducible environments and an introduction to Binder Hub. Um, and you'll learn more about Binder um, in another session, which I believe takes place tomorrow. And then a lot of so good software development best practices as well. So the next guide is the guide for project design, which covers topics related to effective project planning and management. So uh, some of the chapters and content in this guide include planning for uh, project design and documentation, creating project repositories, personas and pathways. So taking into consideration um, who can contribute to your project and how they can do that. Um, things such as code styling and linting, and managing and working on projects with sensitive data. The next guide is the guide for communication, which covers topics related to effective uh, communication and research. And some of the chapters and contents in this guide include over open scholarship and education, how to use um, blogs, podcasts, and social media to promote your work, as well as how to um, you know, develop um, the you know, effective posters and conference talks to get across your research. Um, making research outputs discoverable and publishable. Um, there's a chapter on authorship and peer review. So if you know you get invited to peer review for the first time, there's a nice chapter on, on best practice and peer review, um, how to communicate in open source projects, and then using Binder as a means to transparently and interactively share research. So I know um, Manuel is going to give a, a, a workshop on Binder uh, tomorrow, so you can learn more about that. Um, the next guide is the guide for collaboration, which covers topics related to effective and inclusive collaboration. So there's a lot of content on, uh, content on getting started with GitHub and how to use it for collaboration. Um, we heard from Muhammad this morning that, you know, GitHub isn't maybe the most ethical place to be, but it wasn't always owned by Microsoft. And sometimes it's important to meet your community where they are and take that into consideration when you choose your tools. Um, but these, um, these, uh, this guidance is also applicable to, to the other um, repository platforms as well. There are chapters on effectively organizing meetings, events, and conferences. There are chapters on, you know, managing a new community and team, which include how to plan out, you know, if you'd like to start a community and how you can build best practices um, into your community and into your team, such as teamwork, valuing diversity and differences within the team. Uh, there's a chapter on leadership and data science, which when I went to click on it uh, the other day, it was empty, but there are some uh, personal stories of leadership in this chapter at the minute. Um, there's a chapter on research infrastructure roles, um, where the roles that allow research to happen and that build collaboration are highlighted. So if you heard my role as, communi as a, a community manager and had never heard of that before, you can read more about what this role entails um, in this chapter, along with, you know, project managers, data stewards, research software engineers. Um, there are descriptions of these roles and some case studies um, with people in these roles talking what they get up to uh, day to day. And then there's also a large section on remote collaboration, which you can imagine has expanded quite a bit during the pandemic and become more popular with um, our increasingly distributed teams. Uh, the final guide is the guide for ethical research, which covers topics uh, related to ethical aspects in data science, such as how to work in a way that maintains moral integrity and high scientific standards. So we don't have a whole lot of experience in astrophysics of having to deal with ethics panels um, as our subjects of study um, are not, you know, humans or animals. But this guide includes chapters on how research ethics uh, committees work and ethical decision making, which might become, you know, increasingly important um, as AI and machine learning become um, increasingly used. Uh, it includes chapters on law, policy and human rights and ethics. 
activism for researchers, which includes information, you know, on unions and how to advocate for policy change within your institutions. And there's also a section where you are invited to reflect on your particular position in data science and research. So reflecting on your power and your privilege and how we can promote more inclusive uh, culture in research and data science. And then the final section of the book is the community handbook, which discusses aspects of the Turing Way project um, that you can use for both participating within the project or also reusing and adapting for your own community and projects. So it includes, you know, the code of conduct, it includes the style guide and maintaining consistency within the project. It includes information on how to build the book locally, um, information on how to contribute and develop chapters. And then it also provides a lot of information around acknowledging contributors and contributions within the project. Um, it also provides the template collection. Um, you can also find other things here, like how the project writes its newsletters, runs its events, um, and I'll talk a bit more about the events in the coming slides, how to give a Turing Way talk, so you can see the procedure I followed um, in preparing for this talk today, and there's also information in this community handbook about translating and localizing the Turing Way, so how um, a lot of the concepts can be different for different countries, but then also translating them into different languages, um, such as Spanish. Um, the project is really, really amazing about recognizing all contributions and all contributors. Um, we know that if we don't value them equally, we will end up disproportionately ignoring the hidden labor that a lot of people do, especially from those who are um, from mar marginally marginalized communities or groups or, you know, traditionally excluded from open source and tech spaces. And so they use the all contributors bot to recognize all contribute all contributors in the GitHub repository, including those who do not push code. Um, the project avoids individual authorship in favor of establishing shared ownership and agency in the project. And no matter how big or small your contribution is, all contributors are included as shared authors of the Turing Way. So the project belongs to the community and it is always a work in progress. So in order to kind of represent some of these different perspectives and, um, you know, acknowledging diverse voices and all contributions fairly, um, there's a dedicated section in the community handbook for the contributors record um, where contributors can highlight their personal work and the impact the project has had on them. So you can see uh, mine on the slide from several years ago now. Um, where you can share who you are, um, how people can learn more about you, and what kind of contributions you've made. Um, and this is kind of written differently for everybody who contributes to the project in a way that's meaningful for them. So um, you are encouraged to explore the book further. I'll do a quick demo at the end of the slides. Um, but just note that it is not meant to be read from start to finish. Um, like I said, open science can be quite overwhelming. Don't try to do everything at once, you know, take a small bit at a time, you know. Um, we suggest starting with a concept or a tool or a method that you need now as part of your research. Um, you can browse the different guides to find that topic, or you can use the search functionality uh, to find what you would like to learn about first. Um, ultimately, the, the guides are separated for findability, um, but we do not view them as separate. Um, they're all stops along the road to doing reproducible science. So we've seen the project grow um, and scale just phenomenally over the past four years. Um, and any number I give you today will already be outdated. So the numbers I have is that we currently host over 170 subchapters across five guides. Um, and in order to ensure that our community members are able to participate irrespective of their previous experience of working with the open source or data science community, the project provides the resources, guidance, templates, training and pathways um, that you can use to stay involved in the community. Um, there are over 430 direct contributors on GitHub. There are a few of you in the audience today. Um, and GitHub is where we develop the resources, um, and there are tens of thousands of users. So, for example, um, the illustrations, which you'll have seen extensively throughout this talk, um, have been downloaded over, or sorry, almost 20,000 times. Um, the project also maintains a social media presence um, and communicates about the project so that it can reach as many people as possible and bring new voices in. Um, so for a community that started at the grassroots level, we're very grateful to have all of these members working with us. 
Um, there is a thriving Slack workspace, which is probably the easiest way to get into the project um, to see what's happening, to ask people questions about the best ways to get involved um, and learn more about the community and culture. So yeah, just to reiterate, before you dive into the project, don't expect to read the whole book from cover to cover. Start with the tool or method that you want to learn more about in your current work um, and that you want to apply in your current work. Um, there are many pathways to becoming a contributor um, and collaborator of the project and lots of support from the team to help you get you involved. So for example, um, uh, People are invited to develop and share resources through mentored contributions. There are opportunities for people to maintain and improve resources, which resources which could be as simple as fixing a broken link or a bug um, in the book or creating new resources based on something that you're interested in that you don't see in the book. Um, contributors also include those who share these resources, review and update the existing chapters and translate them um, into different languages to ensure accessibility for a wider community. Um, and then finally, uh, we encourage everyone to share best practices by highlighting their work. So if you um, have a particular use case or case study on how you've applied um, any you know, best practices in your research, you can contribute this as a case study or as a, a user pathway in the book so that others can kind of see how it's applied in practice. So some example opportunities for mentored contributions uh, where you can receive uh, dedicated support to contribute to the project include the collaborations cafes, which happen weekly. Uh, no, sorry, they happen every two weeks. Um, there are weekly co-working calls um, and uh, there are also book dash events, which are events where contributors are brought together to sprint on the book for a week with the team. Um, and this ha happens biannually. So there's actually one happening in May maybe next week, so it's probably too late for that. But um, if you want to get involved and um, either contribute, you know, in person during the book dash or remotely, um, the next one will be in November. Um, but in order to create opportunities to bring people in and highlight their work, we want to meet you where you are. So if you are new to the community, you're very much invited to join. You can learn a new skill or you can share your skills. Um, you can collaborate with others and receive mentoring, or you can mentor others' contributions. And you can also represent this community um, by giving a talk. So there are multiple community events and weekly calls that you're invited to join. So like I said, there are the collaboration cafes, um, which are basically Pomodoro time. So you come, you sprint for a little bit. I think they last, yeah, about two hours. Um, so if you have anything in particular you want to contribute to the Turing Way, it's a great time to do that. If you just want to pop in to chat to the team for a bit to find out a bit more information on if it works for you, the co-working calls is a nice place to do that. Um, there are dedicated translation and localization meetings and then office hours where you can ask any questions that you might be afraid to ask in other places. Um, and I'll share a link in a minute where you can find the links to all of these. There are also monthly fireside chats where the project pulls together a panel to discuss a particular topic. So the most recent one that happened last week was implementing open science at scale. So you can watch this on their YouTube channel um, if you want to catch up with um, their collaboration with the, the NASA TOPS project. And then these are kind of the easiest ways to find out um, more information about the project. So they have a um, a HackMD, which is like a Google Doc, um, where they just have a bunch of links and information on how to, you know, find your particular pathway into the project. And then they've got a start page, which is linked from their um, Twitter and Mastodon accounts, which also have links to help you find exactly where you need to go. Um, but none of this work would be possible without the community of collaborators and contributors. So we would love to invite you to become a contributor to the Turing Way or a user to help us develop um, chapters, you know, on data science and reproducibility, transparent reporting, uh, communication and other topics so that we can help others to stay updated with all of these evolving practices. Um, all kinds of contributions are welcome. Like I said, case studies, your lived experiences are all hugely valuable, um, and you do not need to have any coding experience to contribute. You just need an idea and a willingness to, to learn. Um, so just to summarize, uh, The Turing Way is a book. 
It is also a community where people come together to collaboratively write chapters, build and maintain resources, share their skills and ideas around best practices in data science and research. Um, it is also an open source project where open source principles are uh, applied in the development and maintenance of the project. And then finally, um, it's built on a culture of collaboration, um, which is the process and it's the back the backbone of the project. So as a community developed resource, the Turing Way is always a work in progress. You might find chapters that are under construction, you know, they're missing, you know, a lot of information. And that's just because we're waiting for you to come and contribute that information into the project. Um, just to, before I go on to the, to the demonstrations, I just want to talk about uh, some quick notable impacts beyond the projects. So um, the project was highlighted in the EU report for reproducibility for the scientific results. Um, it was highlighted in a policy by the mayor of London on an emerging technology charter, um, which used the Turing Way for informing their open and inclusive projects. Um, it's used as an example for a lot of uh, projects, um, for example, a funding call from the UK Research and uh, Innovation uh, referenced the project, um, you know, for the culture that it that it cultivates, um, and then a lot of other communities such as uh, the Carpentries and Code Refinery have cross-referenced the Turing Way, and it's been um, cited by articles as well. So just to acknowledge, um, Kirsty Whitaker at the, Allen Turing, at the Allen Turing Institute started this project, and it is currently um, nurtured and cultivated by the community managers, Malvika Sharon and Anne Lee Steele. Um, the bulk of these slides were provided for me um, in the project's promotion pack, and then all of the images were provided by the community and are licensed for reuse. So now I'm going to do some quick demonstrations. So I'm going to stop this share and start a new share just to show you um, how to find and access these things. What's the time? I think I'm okay. So let me move my Zoom windows around a bit. Oops. Can you see that okay on Zoom? Yeah. So um, I've just got the, tur the Turing Way Twitter up um, at the minute just because if you, if you go there, that's a really easy way to find the start page. So, um, you know, it says, you know, welcome, you know, you can click here to go straight to the website where you can read the guides. It's a link. There's a link to join the Slack workspace. You can subscribe to their newsletter. If you want to, you know, contribute and help edit the guides, there's a link to the GitHub repository. Um, there are links for, you know, their event planning calendar that you can subscribe to, to attend any of their events. There's the link to the that fireside chat I mentioned um, and things like that. It's a really great kind of one-stop shop for finding anything you need about the project. You know, if you want to give a Turing Way talk someday, um, you can go here to view the promotion pack and things like that. Um, the other link here, um, just bit.ly slash Turing Way, is that HackMD that I mentioned, which is a bit more comprehensive of a start page. So you can find out more about the project leads, how to contact them, you know, upcoming events in their calendar, um, the upcoming fireside chats, any important announcements for the month, how to connect, um, so how to get in touch with the team, how to join the Slack, where you can find them all over the internet, how to join any of those calls or events, um, and just find out more information about the project, as well as any, you know, available job opportunities and things like that. So information overload, but anything you might want to know about the project, you can find there. So what the book looks like is it's done all on um, GitHub, and I think this is Jupyter Book. Um, so you've got the landing page here. You've got all of the guides here in the sidebar. So if you want to read through the um, guide for reproducible research, you can find all of the subchapters here. So for example, here's the one on version control. It tells you if there are any prerequisites for reading that chapter. You know, if you need some experience with the command line, it gives a summary. It talks about you know the motivation and background for this particular skill. And then you can follow through and find out, you know, the particular workflow for for using version control and getting started with Git and all of these um, all of these subtopics here. Again, you know, there's another chapter on licensing and things like that. Um, so it's a really good place to to start if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed by the process and you want to learn a little bit more about something in particular. And then here are all of the other chapters. You know, the guide for project design, the guide for communication. 
the guide for ethical research and the the community handbook where you can find you know their code of conduct as well as any all of their templates for all of the the community aspects of the project and then finally here's the github repository so if you do want to dive right in and start contributing and getting involved with the project you can see exactly you know the decision making that's done within the project um, there are quite a lot of issues, but if you, you know, see something that you think is missing from, from the guide, you know, a particular topic that you want to learn more about and it's not in there, you can write an issue to say, you know, oh, you know, I'd like a chapter on this, or maybe you want to, you want to um, contribute that chapter, you can, you know, add an issue, you know, that says about that. So I think I've got a ch an issue in here, um, probably for this talk, where is it? I don't know, I've probably gone past it. But anyways, I submitted an issue um, saying that I was going to deliver this talk and it provides a checklist of everything that I needed to do. And then you can also see all of the open pull requests, you know, of all of the, the contributions that are being made directly to the project. So, you know, not only is it a really valuable resource, but it's also a demonstration of, um, you know, open and collaborative research. So it's a really great model that you can take into your research teams and communities. And I think that's it. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. So any question for Rachel? Thank you very much. It's really interesting, uh, all the documentation with the figures and the, the collaborative work. So I'm curious, um, uh, like in my own experience with non-astronomers, uh, just getting, uh, you know, GNU Linux operating system installed, <laughs> it, it takes uh, more than a week. Uh, and then usually they they gradually sh shy away from it. And then they, so um, how, uh, how was the experience in your case, since you're working with non-astronomers from very diverse, um things um uh, these tools now like git can be installed on windows um, um but um but other uh, other uh components of a, of a pipeline how how was your experience in uh yeah i think that's a good question so i'm not um i'm not a core member of the project anymore so i don't have any recent experience of that but i think what's really amazing about this project is because there are so many people involved there is usually somebody who's very willing to help you with your particular issue. So, you know, if you go into the Slack and you'd be like, I need help with this particular thing, somebody will jump up and be like, oh, I'm very happy to help you with that. Um, so I think this project is probably a lot more about the community than the actual resource that's being developed. Um, it's just, it's quite an open culture. People are very willing to learn and take the time to learn these new practices, to get these new things installed um, and to help each other out. Um, so a lot of people, you know, volunteer to give workshops on different things. So like I said, GitHub, using GitHub, because that's what, where the project is developed. There are a lot of workshops that they deliver on, you know, how to use GitHub, how to use Git, trying to make it as easy as possible for you to get involved um, and contribute and uh, work together while also letting you know about how you can apply these skills in your work as well. So yeah, and hearing about the different practices in different domains is is always really interesting and how many different domains, you know, still predominantly use Excel and how can we shift that culture to, you know, um, go towards more towards automation and using um, different programming languages to to make that a bit more sustainable and maintainable um, and things like that. So it's yeah, it's a really, really open and collaborative culture to help you get to where you want to go. Any other question? Yeah, thanks for a really nice talk. This is a really cool project. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on how the the governance works or how how, how this comes together as a project. I mean, so I mean, and in at least on some of the topics you discussed, a lot of the material, I guess, must be quite subjective. So, what's the kind of editorial process? If I have a great idea for something I want to write in a book, 
do I just get to do it or will someone say hey you can't say that in our book or how does it come together yeah Thanks. so um lucky for you let's hope this provides information so there is a governance um dot markdown file where it shows you know what kinds of contributions are allowed look for um how to contribute how authorship works um and things like that so anybody can submit an issue to say here this is something that I would like to see or this is something I would like to contribute and then the core team members will go through that and liaise with you to make sure that you know it adheres to the code of conduct to the governance and you're really mentored through the whole process to make sure that you are able to contribute what you want to contribute um in a way that um works for the project so the team is really supportive in, in helping people um as you can see it, it it does kind of you do get a bit of a backlog with the number of, of things that are going on with the project and i think this is probably where a lot of the bottleneck is is that there's so many people who want to contribute and want to get involved and it's kind of trying to stay on top of this process um, but as the community grows, there's and because there's that shared agency and ownership within the project, you don't always have to rely on the core team to help you contribute something. So, you know, um, what will happen is, you know, maybe you submit, you know, an idea, you know, I want to write a chapter on governance. Um, somebody within the community might be identified as an expert on governance who can then help you and mentor you in your contribution and make sure that it's suitable for the book and it's not going in any way that doesn't um, align with the values of the project and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. That's really cool. Let, let me understand, check if I understand correctly. So you, you mentioned that even for this talk, you uh, add uh, an issue in this repository. Yeah, so let me find it. Here? I think, I wonder if because it's today, um, so like talks and workshops, so that one's not mine, here's mine. So I'll, basically what I did is you can create a new issue and they make it, you know, if you're new to GitHub, they try to make it as easy as possible for you to do this. So, you know, if, um, if you're creating an issue related to that fireside chat, there's a checklist there. If you have a different idea, here's a general template for an issue. If you wanna report a bug in the project, you can report it there. I created a new issue to give a Turing Way talk. So I clicked get started, excuse me. <coughs> and then, so here's my issue. So what it does is it provides a template for the issue that I just fill out. So what I did is I, you know, I put the date of the talk. I said, I've been invited to present on the Turing Way at this uh, school um, and it included the aim of the talk uh, and of the school. Um, because I'm quite, familiar with the Turing way and I'm confident in talking about it. Basically all I did was download the slides from the promotion pack and updated them and, and adapted them for this um, event. Um, and then I did generate a DOI on Zenodo and uploaded my slides. Um, I checked the acknowledgements. Here we go. We're just doing this on the fly. And all of that should be there as well. And then basically once the recording, if you're sharing the recording publicly, I can also add a link to that here. But if you're new to giving a talk, um, so if you're you know a new contributor to the project or you know you're not particularly confident with public speaking yet, you can let the team know and they will meet with you so that you can practice your talk. They can help you develop the slides, um, give you feedback, and really kind of mentor you through the process. So it's yeah, it's really supportive and really great. Um, yeah. This, this kind of mentoring is just for giving talk related to the Turing way because you mentioned before something like um, and the project design, no? The, and there is a, a chapter with a project design, so in, in some way you teach or uh, people there how to. It's kind a kind of mentoring, so you you can ask for this kind of mentoring. In, yeah. Here in this yeah. So in the Slack channel, you could you know say that you know I've got an upcoming talk on my work and. I'd like some assistance. And there are so many people that are, you know, very supportive and empowering that I'm sure somebody would be really, really happy to help you. But um, let's see. So in the guide for communication, there should be one on presenting posters and conference talks. So there's a lot of information here about, you know, 
and guidance and advice on, you know, how you can do that, how you can promote it, how you can share your presentation. So for example, like sharing your slides on um, Zenodo or Figshare, things like that, um, how to make your presentation slides accessible. So things like colors to use where you can access images um, that are not subject, you know, to copyright and things like that, um, or that are um, uh, openly shared and available for your reuse. Um, things like, you know, if you're recording a presentation remotely or you're pre-recording or something, there's advice here on, you know, tools that you can use to do that. Um, what to expect from speaking invitations, you know, um, if it's from, you know, an event like this, you know, it's not super common to necessarily get honoraria for giving a talk, but if you're invited by, you know, a tech conference that, you know, makes a profit on their event, then it's absolutely, you know, encourage that you should ask for an honoraria to give your talk. Um, yeah, there's lots of, um, and lots of personal stories as well. So um, if you're not quite sure necessarily how you fit in, you can read some of the, the personal stories about people um, in each of the chapters to see, you know, how that particular topic relates to them or their experiences um, in that particular aspect or subchapter. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot here. <laughs> Any other question? It's thanks again, Rachel. And um, yeah, don't forget, um, we've got postcards and stickers up here. Very sorry to the remote folk, um, but please do take some. Um, I'll leave them here uh, for, your, for you to take throughout the event. Um, but yeah, thank you so much.